Um, a little bit of a historical perspective, and just in terms of where we're at now in terms of iPads and, and how quickly things have moved in a relatively short period of time, talk about tablets in general. So much of the research is focused on iPads, but there are other tablets out there, and so you know, I'll use kind of tablets and iPads and iPod touches sort of interchangeably somewhat. But the application of tablets in terms of specific skill areas that people are focusing on, as well as instructional strategies that people are investigating in terms of you know, how do we teach uh, tablet use to individuals. Um, we'll look at a variety of studies. I'll give you kind of an overview of what the research says around these various skill areas that have been investigated and I'll also give you some specific examples so I'll pull a few studies here and there and we'll kind of take a look at some graphs and talk about what kids have been taught and how people taught specific skills and, and what we know from that um, and kind of finish off with some future directions in terms of you know the little bit that we know right now and where are we going to need to go in the future. So I wanted to start with a really short walk down memory lane, and it is going to be a really short walk because um, things haven't been around for that long. The video iPod was introduced in 2005, so not quite 10 years ago, and a lot of the early research focused on video modeling off of the video iPod because this was kind of the first device that we could play video off of. Um, in 2007, we got the iPod Touch and the iPhone were introduced, so seven years ago. And um, as hard as it may seem uh, to believe, the iPad was only introduced in 2010, April 2010. So we've had it around for just barely over four years. Um, so all of these technologies have only been available for less than 10 years. So when you think about that in terms of a research context, um, it's <sighs> wow. Um, because there's actually been a lot that's been done in a fairly short period of time. And if we look at, here are research-based publications that I was able to find um, in a relatively exhaustive, but probably not as exhaustive as it could have been. So there may be a couple other studies floating out, out and about there. But you see that you know, by 2012, 2013, the number of studies have increased to, you know, in 2013, about 16, 17 studies. And so far in 2014, we're already at eight. Um, and so I found studies up uh, that, that are online pre-publications that came out in the last couple weeks that are in April, May editions of journals. So uh, already in 2014, we've got a fair bit. So I expect that by the end of 2014, um, we'll probably surpass the research that was done in 2013. And there are also uh, a number of dissertations that students have done out. So I've found the three, four, five, six dissertations that people have, have worked on, so I'm anticipating that those will also appear in journals um, in the not too distant future. In terms of skill areas, looking at all of the research that uh, people have done so far, lots of research in the area of uh, communications. So we're going to talk some about that. A lot of research in daily living. Some research in employment, so people looking at how we can use tablets to support adults in employment setters, uh, or in employment settings. Um, a fair number of studies have started to look at academic skill instruction and how we can teach academic skills uh, across the age range. A little bit of leisure skills, a couple studies have looked at early intervention related topics, so I'll, I'll talk briefly about that, and also a few things outside of kind of the area of education that have looked at teaching health and safety, so I'll kind of give you some idea of some of the things that people are doing there. But I thought we'd start with communication because it's probably the area where um, the most research has been done so far. And a bulk of the communication research has focused on comparing tablet-based AAC with other kinds of AAC modalities. So a lot of comparison of iPad or iPod Touch versus manual signing and or iPad, iPod touch versus manual signing versus picture-based systems. So either point to pictures or picture exchange, not necessarily the picture exchange communication system packs, but some sort of exchange type picture-based system. Um, and people have been looking at essentially, can kids learn each modality? And how long does it take them to kind of learn each modality? Um, the thing about most of these is that the studies have looked at generally 
a field of one, so one symbol, up to kind of a field of four. So we're not teaching kid, uh, kids how to request with a whole bunch of vocabulary. It's fairly tightly controlled. Um, but they've also been looking at participant preference of modality. And do individuals display a preference? Can we figure out what their preference might be? Um, if we know what the preference is early on, does that affect how quickly they learn a specific modality? So if they tend to lean towards the iPad, does that mean that they learn how to communicate, how to make requests primarily with an iPad faster than they learn how to do requests um, in other areas? And so there are seven, eight studies that have looked specifically at comparing tablet-based AAC versus other kinds of AAC. So just to kind of summarize what people have found so far, um, most participants are able to meet criterion in terms of acquisition, which is usually set at 80%, give or take, depending on the researchers. But most individuals are meeting criterion for tablet-based and picture-based AAC. So they learn whatever communication skill is being taught. Some meet criterion for manual sign, but time and again, most of the participants, if they demonstrate difficulty with anything, demonstrate the most difficulty with manual sign. And people talk about a variety of reasons why that may be, and I don't think that that's all that different from what we've known in the past about manual sign for lots of kids. Um, individuals with ASD and or developmental disabilities. So lots of this research focuses not just on individuals with ASD, but people with developmental disability, intellectual disability. Um, and again, they have preferences, and I don't think that that's anything necessarily new. And these kinds of studies have been done with sort of older generation speech generating devices, the old $10,000 seven pound machines. Um, what's interesting is that most have a preference and demonstrate a preference often for tablet-based AAC options, but not all of them do. And I think that that's a really important thing to remember, right? So individuals have a preference, and the preference isn't always for the technology, right? So sometimes our preference may be for the technology, but that may not actually be the kid's preference, and that's important to remember. Um, some people, some of the kids in these studies, demonstrate their preference really early on. So before intervention even starts, they do preference assessment and see, well, what does it look like the kid chooses most often when we give choices? And um, they find that some, some of those kids will indicate their preference quite strongly, quite early on, and rapidly acquire skill in that modality. So I like the iPad, and I learn to use the iPad faster than I learned the other modalities. But again, that's not the case for everybody. And some individuals don't demonstrate a preference at all until they become skillful in one of the modalities. And sometimes that's a tablet. And sometimes it's often a picture-based, right? Generally not manual sign. So for some individuals, their preference is early on they know what they like and they learn to use that pretty quickly. Other individuals don't demonstrate a preference and kind of wait um, to see how to use the various communication systems as they sort of develop some skill, then they start to lean towards. So again, there are differences in how people may... Um, demonstrate a preference, and I think that that's important when we start to think about choosing systems for kids. Do we go tablet-based? Do we go other-based, right, non-technical? And when is that decision made, and do we reevaluate as we go along as kids start to learn different kinds of skills? So people are playing around still with that question. Again, right, the, the, none of these questions are answered solidly at this point because the technology's been around for less than 10 years. Um, but I wanted to go over one study that's quite reflective of all of the studies in this category. This study came out quite recently, 2014, um, and they were actually looking to expand upon all of the other comparative research that's been done to date. And so they looked at um, acquisition of manual sign, picture exchange, and SGD, they called SGD, which was either an iPod Touch or an iPad loaded with Prolo Quo to Go. Okay, so we're familiar with the Prolo Quo to Go app. Okay, so they had nine kids with ASD ranging in age from four to 12. Varying but relatively limited verbal abilities, so some of them had some echolalia or a couple of words, but primarily used pointing, gesture, guidance, a few signs. Um, one student used real objects, so these were not talkers. Um, all of the kids had minimal or no experience with manual sign or picture exchange, so a few of them had been exposed to picture exchange or picture-based systems as, an, as AAC, but 
not a whole lot, and no one had had experience with SGD. So that's kind of just to give you an overview of the kids. Um, so like I said, the SGD system was an iPod Touch, or eventually for one kid who was having difficulty with a small screen, they switched to an iPad loaded with Proloquo to go. And for this study, they had four locations. Three of them were blank, just white squares. And one square had the symbol for more. And again, this is fairly reflective of a lot of the studies in this kind of category. It's either only one symbol is visible, or there's a small set of locations, but only one of them has a symbol not choosing between different symbols, right, okay? So that was what the SGD condition looked like. The picture exchange condition looked exactly the same, except it's a laminated card with four cards Velcroed. Three of the cards were blank. One had the symbol for more. And then for the manual sign, this was a study done in New Zealand, so the participants were taught the New Zealand sign for more, which looks like this. And the sign was graphically displayed on a picture card next to three blank picture cards. They tried to make things look as much the same as they could across all of the conditions. They used an alternating treatments design to compare the acquisition in each of the conditions, and it was a non-concurrent multiple baseline across those participants. Um, students had one to three sessions per day over one to three days per week. Um, they targeted one modality, so they focused in one session on signing or picture exchange, or SGD. So one session focused on one, and they had five opportunities per session. And essentially, um, they had a preference assessment they started off with, and they laid out all three AAC systems on the table. So the iPad, the picture exchange cards, and the cards that had the picture for the sign. Which do you want to use? Um, and what they were asking for were toys. So they would let the kids access some toys, they'd take the toys away, have the kid choose a system, and then they would say, let me know if you want more. And the idea was that the kid either pushed the button for more if they chose the iPad, touched the picture, exchanged the picture for more if they wanted more, or gave the sign, depending on what they chose. Um, and if they asked for more, they got the toys back, and if they did nothing, that was the end. Um, baseline, toys were in a box with a lid. They were told, let me know if you want the toys, they had 10 seconds to respond, um, and after every baseline, they redid the preference assessments. They continually collected some preference assessment data. Um, intervention used discrete trial teaching. So they used DTT to teach each of the modalities, right? Any session focused on just one modality at a time. Their criterion was 80% or higher, correct requesting over three consecutive sessions, so that, that's when it was considered acquired. Um, for many of the students, they had to do some sort of procedural modification. Um, so for some kids that weren't getting anywhere, they did gradual guidance. Um, they might have done physical prompting. Um, for one kid, they replaced the iPod with the iPad. After the kids learned how to make their requests, they did the preference assessment again, and um, then they did follow-up. And follow-up was three to ten weeks after that last post-teaching session and was exactly the same as the intervention, but no prompts. And again, they did preference assessments. So if we look at the graphs, I didn't include the graphs in your handouts because they would have come out teeny, teeny, tiny, but you've got all the references, so if you want to go and look at actual data... You can do that, but um, kid one, kid two, kid three, we're looking at percent correct. Um, SGD are little diamond shapes, so I'll kind of trace the path of SGD. So here's baseline for a kid. Here's SGD, 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 SGD. So that's during intervention. Um, squares are physical exchange, so here's baseline. He didn't do anything. Physical exchange... He got physical exchange in the end, manual sign, so he wasn't manually signing in baseline, a little bit up, down, still at 80%. So you can see that he kind of acquired all of them. He always in post-teaching chose SGD, right, the iPad, and in follow-up he maintained at 80% or above everything, right? So for him... Um, he made one request during baseline with the SGD using Proloquo to go once, right there. Um, he did learn all of them. He met criterion for Proloquo to go for the SGD in nine sessions, so it took him a little longer to get the SGD. 
than it did the other ones. It took seven sessions for manual sign and physical exchange. But he was a kid who had um, indicated in baseline a preference for SGD, and that held out. So he was one of those kids where even though SGD was harder for him, it took him longer to learn, that was his preference, and he kind of stuck with that. And this is the preference grid for each kid. So you can kind of see for this kid as well, um, he learned them all. This kid got pulled from the study after seven intervention sessions, um, not reported why, but his parents withdrew him from the study. But you can see the black bars over here are choosing SGD. So for all of those preference assessments, if you see a black bar, it means that they're choosing SGD. Um, the kind of half and half or physical exchange dotted our manual sign, and if it's blank, it means they chose nothing. So they put everything out on the table and they gave them 10 seconds to indicate a choice, and if they didn't, the trial was considered over. For, for Henry, the top kid, he chose SGD 86% of, of the time out of all of those preference assessments. Physical exchange, 4%. Manual sign, 4%. He never made no selection, but he leaned very heavily towards um, use of the iPad. The second kid here, he chose SGD, the iPad, 60% of the time. Phys uh, picture exchange, 23%. Manual sign, 16%. So he still chose some of the other options and chose SGD not as much. Um, Andy kind of, they don't have much of anything for Andy because he left. If we look at some of the other kids in this study, we'll see that for some of the kids, they're kind of all over the board. Um, and other kids learned all and learned all really quickly. Right? Some of the kids show, made fewer selections in terms of choices. So again, some of those kids are the kids where they didn't select a preference, they didn't indicate a preference until they kind of learned what they were supposed to do. And then once they learned, they started to lean towards one system over another. Um, so again, right, across all of the kids, it can be quite variable, right? So, you know, the moral of the story being that one system isn't the best system for anybody and that these are individual preferences and individual skill sets, right? These are the other kids. So, again, there are some kids never got the manual sign, right? Manual sign was bottomed out across everything. Um, but most of the kids in these studies acquired both SGD, iPad, and picture exchange, right? So for most of the kids, those were the two. If, if we were going to acquire two, we were acquiring those two, and we were not acquiring manual sign if we were going to have difficulty with anything. And again, if you look at the black bars, you see lots of black bar. Black bar tends to be bigger than the others, right? Um, so that's this study, which just came out, is quite reflective of the information that comes across from the other studies. So for this one, five out of the nine kids all learned how to make requests via all three modes. Right? So five of the nine learned all three. Um, three didn't reach criterion for any mode. Um, one was pulled. Um, two showed significant difficulty for manual signs. So again, some real variance. Um, Eight out of the nine, with the ninth being the kid who got pulled, eight out of the nine preferred the SGD iPad over the other stuff, again, to varying degrees. So one kid was like SGD all the way, he never chose anything else, and other kids at varying degrees um, leaned more heavily towards the SGD. So again, you know, it's really important to think about what the preferences are and how the preference might affect acquisition, but also paying attention to preference as we're teaching. And these authors suggested that as we're teaching, it might really behoove us to kind of reevaluate preferences and not just evaluate preferences on day one. Okay, he, he picked up the SGD more than he picked up anything else, so we're going to use iPads and that's it. But to continue to check in and see. And again, I think that this is really reflective of the comparison kinds of studies that have been done in the AAC literature using other kinds of SGDs that were available before we had iPads. Right? So this is, in many respects, not a lot new. They've just kind of redone this research using iPads. Right? And I think for some of the kids, more and more, where they have experience with iPads, that's also likely to color their choice. It's like, well, I already know this. This is familiar. Um, oh, and hey, it's not so difficult when you teach me how to use it. Okay. The other area in terms of communication 
that people have been looking at is just acquisition of communication behaviors, usually requesting, but a few others, um, using tablet-based SGD applications. So a variety of applications, um, but in this case, we're not comparing do they learn this faster than manual sign or picture. It's just we're going to use a tablet, we're going to teach this communication skill, how quickly do they learn it, what can they learn to do with it, essentially. So there are a variety of studies that have been done. Um, one study in 2010 actually looked at um, an individual who had learned how to, kind of, use tablet-based uh, SGD app, but wasn't activating the speech. He wasn't hitting the buttons correctly, hitting hard enough, essentially, to make it talk. So he would touch it, but he wouldn't touch it correctly. And he'd actually, the professionals involved had suggested that this was a fine motor issue, right? That he, you know, was a fine motor problem. We needed to do fine motor work. And instead, they decided to take a look at it more from a behavioral perspective and suggested that it was really a response problem and that we could teach him that behavior. It's not that his motor skills are poor. It's just that he doesn't know what behavior he's supposed to do. And so they used shaping to teach him the behavior that he needed to do, how hard to press the button to make it talk. And they reinforced him when he did so. And fairly quickly, he learned how to press the button correctly to make the device talk to access what he wanted. So that was the study that's been done. Um, another study, and I think that we need to be seeing more in this kind of vein, looks at teaching not just, here's the iPad screen with the one symbol of the one thing that I'm holding up, but here's the iPad. Turn it on. <laughs> Unlock it. Press the folder button that takes you to the vocabulary that then allows you to ask for what you want. Because in real life, that's the behavior that people need to be able to to know how to do, right? And so most of the research hasn't looked at this at all. And this study has kind of begun the process. They taught how to turn on, how to navigate between two pages and make a request, either for snacks or for toys, right? So they had two folders, essentially. Touch the snack folder and then choose a food, touch the toy folder and then choose a toy, right? But looking at multiple steps. One study recently, and we're going to look at this one today, used the iPad in sort of a story script to teach play dialogue to kids with ASD and teach them how to essentially use toys and talk about the toys, right? So they used the iPad as a teaching tool. So we're going to look at that one and I'll take you through it. Um, a 2014 study looked at increasing vocabulary usage in teens with ASD. So using more nouns, using more verbs in conversation. A 2014 study looked at using um, the iPad and following kind of the PECS protocol in terms of phases to teach symbol discrimination. So starting off with just the symbol and teaching them to tap the button, then the symbol with a blank, then the symbol of a preferred item with a symbol for a less preferred item, and then more and more symbols until now we've got individuals discriminating, right? So how can we do that kind of work with kids? Um, increasing social communication. So Vandermeer and Vandermeer, if you're looking at research, if you're interested in iPad and communication, Vandermeer and colleagues are doing kind of the bulk of it. So you'll see in your reference list a lot of Vandermeer, and this is a group to be paying attention to if you're interested in the communication side of things. Um, and also a study came out recently looking at AAC displays, and I'm going to show you this one as well. There are various kinds of AAC apps that demonstrate vocabulary and message items in different ways. How do we make some choices or what might we want to be thinking about um, in terms of displays and what displays might work better for kids? So the broad summary in terms of communication research, behavior analytic instruction. Right? We have to teach kids how to use iPads, iPod touches, other tablets, and AAC apps. It is not as simple as go forth and communicate. And I think that right, that happens an awful lot. And it happened a lot with other AAC speech generating devices, Dynavoxes and, and, and so on and so forth. It's kind of like, you know, here's the system and we've programmed it with thousands of vocabulary items. Good luck with that. Right? And that has happened again with iPads because it's very easy and very inexpensive to get an AAC app that has a whole bunch of vocabulary and put it in front of a kid and right, go communicate. And then they don't. And the conclusion people often make is he's not motivated, he's not smart enough. He, right? 
we need to teach individuals how to communicate. And right, if you look at all of the research that's been done so far, a variety of behavior analytic instructional procedures have been used. So discrete trial teaching, errorless instruction, um, response prompting, and then systematic fading of those prompts. So teaching kids what they need to do to activate um, the speech. Using time delay in terms of prompting, um, within stimulus prompting, so the individual who did the research looking at symbol discrimination, that was all about within stimulus prompts. Um, there's a symbol, there's a blank, and that helps prompt the individual in terms of what symbol do I touch. Um, shaping, reinforcement, so actually providing external reinforcement to kids initially to teach them the skills, the behaviors that they need to engage in. So we look at the literature, good instruction is required, right? and that's kind of a critical thing that people need to remember. Um, what we know at this point in terms of what we're able to teach, basic requesting, basic manding is essentially all that the literature has addressed, right? save for a couple of studies. Um, people have been focused on requesting, and I think again, Requesting is often easier to teach than a lot of the social communication stuff, and that's where we tend to start. It's an area of research need where we need to be focusing on teaching other kinds of um, communication behaviors, communication responses. People have found that in terms of success with tablet-based AAC, um, it's most is often associated with preference. So if if the kid has indicated a preference for tablet, those kids tend to be more successful with tablets. Um, if instruction, kind of duh, is embedded within highly preferred activities, right? So if it's fun and motivating and exciting, kids tend to do better. And again, if there's individualized instruction, so not here's the app, go good luck, but I'm gonna sit down and we're gonna engage in some structured activities and I'm gonna use some good instructional strategies to teach you, and then we'll work on generalizing it to other activities, other settings, other people. Those kinds of things are highly associated with success. Um, because research is focused primarily on requesting with a fairly small set of vocabulary, that kind of sets the stage for where we need to go in terms of research. Right? Um, instruction around other kinds of communication behaviors, moving beyond requesting, social communication, asking for information, right? all, all of those other kinds of things. Uh, larger sets of vocabulary and teaching kids how to navigate through that. How do I find the vocabulary that I need? And, and as a teacher, how do I teach that? Because right? again, as a teacher, it's really easy for me to teach the kid to press more or to press juice or to press cookie. Right? But how do I teach the kid how to combine symbols to make a sentence? How do I teach the kid to navigate through multiple folders to get to the vocabulary that I'm looking for? Um, and then also, how do we select display modes? How do I know that for this kid, I should display all my, vo my vocabulary in a grid? Or for this kid, I should display it in a different manner. Um, and a study that has looked at this very question, started to look at this question, um, Jeff Archer et al. in 2014, and they looked at grid-based, that's this, with a symbol in a square, fairly traditional, and they looked at one vocabulary item, um, versus what's known as a visual scene display. So they used an app where essentially a visual scene display is an image of a scene and there are hot spots, and when you touch images within the scene, right, so if you touch the Lego, it says Lego, and if there was a teddy bear in the scene and you touch teddy bear, it would say teddy bear, and so on and so forth. Again, they were looking at one vocabulary item. Um, so they looked at grid-based versus visual scene versus a combined. And so this is an app that allows you to have a visual scene, but then you've got symbol-based vocabulary in the bottom, and what was required for the kids for this task was to either press this button to access to, to ask for Lego, press the hot spot to ask for Lego, or for this one they had to touch the little symbol down here to ask for Lego. So not this one, but this one. Okay? And they looked at um, three kids with ASD that were all three. So they had a kid that was three years one month, three years six months, three years 11 months. Um, they taught using a least to most prompt hierarchy, so the least amount of prompt I have to give you, and if you still don't do it, I'll give you a little more of a prompt and a little more all the way up to I fully physically prompt you. Um, two out of the three of those kids did best with the hot spot. They acquired the hot spot 
um, more rapidly and never got the combined. And one out of three got all in a similar number of sessions. So here are their graphs. So criterion met, criterion met, never met criterion for combined. This kid never met criterion for combined, but met criterion for um, the hotspot and met criterion for the symbol button, this one. And this kid, they ended up, he, he was not motivated to ask for the same thing, so they had to come up with different things that he could ask for. So he was asking for blueberries, he was asking for right, other kinds of stuff. But again, um, he's the one who acquired all of them in a fairly rapid time frame. Right? So thinking about, should we, could we, probably we should, be doing some assessment like this before we make an app decision? Do we go with grid-based? Do we go with visual scene? Pick a few words of highly motivating things, set up some displays, do a little teaching, see which the kid learns best, and start our instruction there, as opposed to choosing something that's really difficult for the kid and spending a whole year trying to teach the kid something that, you know, if we'd gone with a display that made more sense to him, and particularly for young kids, we've got a lot of evidence that suggests visual scene displays are quite successful for them, right, because they make a bit more sense. You see the items that you want to communicate about within kind of this contextualized scene as opposed to a bunch of boxes with symbols in them. Right. So thinking about those kinds of things up front um, and how can we make some good decisions. Right now, a lot of people make AAC app decisions based on what they saw on Facebook, what they saw in 60 Minutes, what the kid in the next classroom is using, what the parent at the parent group is using with her kid. Right. So those are the things that are leading people to make choices. And I suggest that those are probably not the best ways of making choices. Right. We need to individualize our decision making. Um, the other study I wanted to show you in terms of the communication stuff, um, not so much because it's reflective of a bunch of research, but because it's a little bit different from what other people have done so far in this area. Um, they looked at using the iPad to deliver an intervention that was kind of social story-esque um, to increase play dialogue. So their, their goal was to get kids talking during play with their peers, essentially, and looking at can we use the iPad to help teach this skill. And that's the other thing that people are doing more and more with the iPad. It's not just can they use the iPad to communicate, but can we use the iPad to teach communication or to teach other kinds of skill. So they had um, four kids with ASD, all of them were four, all of them were boys, and they used Keynote, right? So a lot of people are also looking at, can we use our iPads and not buy special software, but use stuff that we already have with our Macs and that we can have on our iPad, a lot of native apps people are looking at using. But with Keynote, they um, created a slideshow with figurines, little toy figurines, and they recorded voiceover. Right, so they can do, you can do all of this on the iPad now. And so they had voiceover that represented the figurines talking. And the participants were taught to advance through the slideshow by touching the iPad screen and activate the voiceover. So every page, you got to hear the figurines say stuff. Um, and while they were learning, the sessions were typically less than five minutes where they were teaching the kids how to go through the story. And um, every sort of instructional session, they had to go through at least once. If they were game, they could go through it up to three times. They also needed to produce or imitate the speech from the script. So the researchers wanted to know that they were paying attention to the voice over, that they could say what, what the figurines were saying. They used a multiple baseline across participants and they had a fireman set that was one of the, the scripts that they used. Um, baseline was a data probe with an adult. The adult had the figurines out. It was a two minute probe. The adult would initiate um, play with one of the scripted phrases. You know, let's play with the firefighters and start with a couple of lines of dialogue from the story and see if the kid did anything. Um, during instruction, there were one to three story readings. So like I said, they did this instruction, taught the kids how to go through the story. They had to imitate the script. Then they did priming. So priming was before we play with the toys. So now we're going to play with the toys. You're going to read the story once or listen to the story once. Um, no practice, no prompts. 
Then they worked on generalization. So after the priming phase, they did generalization. So the kid with a peer sat and went through the story, and then the kid and the peer have the toys, and they measured to see if the kid scripted any of the language or said other stuff. Um, withdrawal, no story, data probe with adult, and then they did a follow-up for three of the participants, and again, during follow-up, the kids didn't read the story. This is kind of like, let's see what you remember. Um, just to give you a sense of the dialogue, so the dialogue, the girl says, help, my tree house is on fire, and the firefighter says, quick, everybody into the truck. Raise the ladder. Firefighter two, I'll save her. The girl, oh, thank you, you are so brave. Just doing my job, ma'am. So, right. I think that we should get kids making up the scripts sometimes because I think that they probably have a better sense of what would be said. But nonetheless, you know, you know when I've heard somebody say, just doing my job, ma'am, but whatever. Um, so here's the data for four of the kids. Um, this kid you'll see here, Andrew, didn't do so well. Uh, he, all of the kids were in an ABA early intervention program, and this kid was demonstrating problem behavior kind of across the day. He started wetting his pants, he was right, having all kinds of issues all over the place, so they think something else was going on but weren't quite sure. But you see that with all of the other kids, increase in frequency of play dialogue utterances. So they just measured, were they saying anything? Um, so increases during instruction, during priming, during generalization, withdrawal, and then this is the follow-up data. Um, what's interesting though as well, always interesting when we're doing scripted based stuff is how much was scripted and how much was novel and for two of the kids in particular um, especially at follow up for this kid here's uh, novel speech and you see that his scripted speech is actually going down so now he's starting to say things that weren't part of the script so not only did he learn to engage in dialogue with somebody else while playing with the toys, but now he's saying new things. Um, Jacob never got any novel speech. He entirely produced scripted stuff. Um, but Joe really started engaging in a lot of novel speech, and his scripted speech came way down, right? So, and he did that pretty early on. So he, right here during the priming condition, he started engaging in novel speech, and his scripted speech came down to zero, essentially, and he just... It's like, oh, this is what I'm supposed to do. So this is a nice case of how can we use the iPad to teach a skill that in this case is an interactive play-based skill, right, that I could do with an adult, that I could do with another kid, but a really simple intervention, right? Like, let's place some figurines, clip some pictures, record the audio on our iPad, and we're good to go. Right. We're going to talk at, sort of at the end about the workload aspect of this, but this is one, a fairly simple thing to do that frankly at this point, most older siblings could do. Right? Like The older siblings probably better than most of the adults because they're quite skillful with the technology, they're digital natives, whereas the rest of us are not. So you kind of hand it to them and say, here, make a story, right? make the characters talk. They can do that. Right? So in terms of the workload issue, we probably have, have a labor force that's out there. Um, so moving on to early intervention stuff, there are only two studies that I've found that have looked at kind of teaching early intervention skills to kids with ASD, kind of thinking early intervention programs um, so far. And both of those studies have looked at teaching imitation and how we can use the iPad to target imitation as a behavior, as a skill. Um, one stu both of them are in 2012. Uh, one study, uh, the author looked at teaching a four-year-old with ASD first to attend to and imitate a video model. Because frankly, video modeling does us no good if you don't look at the screen and you don't know that you're supposed to copy what you see on the screen. Right? And there's a whole bunch of video modeling, iPad research that's been done. Right? But this is kind of the pivotal skill here. If you don't look at and copy, video modeling is going to take you nowhere. So that was the first thing that he taught and actually went the very kind of behaviorally based intervention, holding little candies behind his iPhone to get the kid's eyes on the iPhone and then reinforced the kid when he watched and then taught him to copy and reinforced copying. And then once he got that, he actually had a video of a kid engaging in the exchange part of picture exchange. And the reason that he did this, he was working with a kid and they didn't have a second prompter. You know, with the picture exchange communication system, you're supposed to have a second prompter that physically prompts that exchange. He didn't have a second prompter and he thought, well, I wonder if I could use video modeling to teach the kid 
to exchange, and lo and behold, he did. Um, so the kid watched a video of another child exchanging, and because he taught him how to attend to and imitate what he saw on the screen, that's what the kid did. So that was a nice study. Uh, Cardin in 2012 looked at teaching parents um, to do imitation training with their kids with autism, but also taught them how to create video models. So they went through a, an instructional kind of course with the parents, brief instruction, how to, with your iPad, take video, how to narrate it, how to do whatever you need to do with it, um, and then once you create the video, how to use that to teach your kids simple motor imitation tasks. So those are the only two studies that have been done to date really focused on early intervention skills with kids. Both of them have been imitation. I suspect that we'll start to see more research in the area of early intervention start to happen because a lot of people are using iPads and early intervention programs, but again, we kind of have no research at this point in terms of what should we be using our iPads for during early intervention sessions with kids? How should we? What kinds of skills should we target, et cetera, et cetera. So, that, so far, imitation is all we have, and we only have two studies. The other thing, area that's received a bit of attention is the area of leisure skills. Um, two studies have looked specifically at, can I teach somebody to use this uh, as a leisure activity? to watch videos, to listen to music, right? So the kinds of things that we already use our tablets for as, as leisure, but specifically teaching individuals with fairly significant disabilities um, to do that on their own, so that now they have some sort of leisure skill to engage in. Um, a more recent study, Carlisle in 2013, and I saw, this was a master's student, this was her master's project, I saw her at ABAI in Seattle um, presenting this data, which was really nice. Um, she looked at picture activity schedules on an iPod Touch and teaching individuals with autism to use that picture activity schedule and independently transition through a bunch of leisure activities. So essentially teaching, go play, and here's the list of things that you're going to do go do it by yourself. So I thought that we'll talk through that one a little bit. Um, so she looked at the picture activity schedule. She wanted to teach kids with autism how to independently play, right? which is what a lot of parents want their kids with autism to be able to do. Like, I'm cooking dinner, I'm doing laundry, or crying out loud, I just like to read a book. Go, right? do something and don't bother me for the next 30 minutes. Um, so they identified from general ed peers, ask them what kinds of activities would be fun, right? And they kind of had some ideas, but they sort of surveyed general ed peers to identify some leisure activities that would be age appropriate, that would be kind of fun, um, right? So not weird things that the adults might think would be appropriate, but things that the peers would actually think would be appropriate. Um, then they did, from that 15, did some preference assessments with the kids with autism to get a list of 10. Five things that were for training and five things that were used for generalization. Things like um, Nerf basketball, the air hogs, hella blaster, things that I'm not even sure what they are, um, Beyblade, metal fusion, some sort of spinning top thing, they fight in a ring, right? Apparently things that are cool to the other kids that, right, again, us ad adults don't really know about. Um, four kids with autism, all boys, between the ages of 8 and 12, that were in an ABA-based school program. These were all kids, as I think we're finding more and more, all of the kids are already exposed to tablets in one way, shape, or form. I think it's going to be harder and harder for anybody to find participants for a study where the participants have never seen an iPad unless we're talking preschoolers and even then. Um, so they'd all used iPod Touches at school for games or music. Um, they also all had used non-tech picture activity schedules. So they were familiar with, here are a bunch of paper symbols, right, laminated, and I move through and I do, do my activities. Um, but they hadn't had that yet on a device. So multiple probes across participants. Um, essentially, the directive across all phases was go play, and there were toys. Um, the iPod schedule was available during baseline, but they'd had no instruction on it, so the schedule was there. Go play, and the kids, of course, didn't know what to do. Um, intervention involved hand-over-hand -hand prompts to teach the kids how to use the schedule, and this is what the schedule looked like. Again, not fancy, and they used native apps. 
They took photos of the toys on the device. They were in the photo album, and they sequenced them in an album. They also had, um, she'd made little icons, and right, you can edit your photos on your device now too, of a clock. And what the kids were taught to do was to reference the activity, press the home button, open the clock app that was preset to two minutes. And it was two minutes per activity. So you did an activity for two minutes and then the timer went off. You opened your photo album again, looked at the next picture. The clock prompted you to press the home button, go back to the clock, start the timer, two minutes, and so on and so forth. So that, that's what they taught the kids how to do. Hand over hand prompts and then faded that. Um, they used progressive time delay to help with the fading of the prompts. They used conditioned reinforcers to reinforce the kids for doing what they were supposed to do, essentially, and staying on task. The kids earned pennies, and you know, this was something that they were already familiar with, and then they traded in the pennies for backup reinforcers later, right? Ten pennies equals whatever it equaled. Um, they faded out the schedule of reinforcement, so initially they got reinforced quite heavily, and eventually they faded out that reinforcement altogether, because... You're playing with toys, and ideally, right, understandably, that should be reinforcing if we've selected toys that you've indicated you like. The reinforcement is in play, so I don't, shouldn't have to give you other stuff to reinforce you later. So they faded that out. They also faded out the experimenter. So initially, the experimenter was in the room. At the end of the study, the experimenter was out of the room. So the kid was alone in a room with no adult supervision, and just had the picture schedule, right? So that was the goal, was that you can independently, without an adult even being near you, do what you're supposed to do. And in this case, what you're supposed to do is play with toys. Um, they promoted generalization with a whole bunch of uh, strategies, but primarily they used various locations and various activities, um, multiple exemplars of activities. So they had one activity, but with slightly different materials. Um, they used the same timer in all the picture schedules, so that helped to generalize, because anytime I see that little clock, I know that I'm supposed to go press the start button. So some of those kinds of things helped um, promote generalization, and then they also looked at maintenance over time. So here's their data. And their graphs, you will want to go and take a look at this because they've got all kinds of itty bitty bits of data in there, including how many seconds of a delay was there to prompt, how many feet away was the adult. So those are all the little numbers that are written up there. But essentially, completed percentage of correctly completed schedule components. Um, baseline, they couldn't. Here's instruction, they could. And this is generalization, and their generalization was with those five other toys. So they looked at, within here, generalizing with different locations. So same toy, but in a different room. But this was completely different activities that weren't part of the instruction. And so you see that as instruction went on, they also demonstrated the ability to now do the same activities with toys that you didn't teach me to follow a schedule with. Um, and then they looked at two-week... And up to, I believe they looked at three-month follow-ups. So they did three follow-up points, two week, one month, three months. And so you see that for all of the kids, they all learned the task and it maintained. And for, to varying degrees, they all generalized to some, some degree, right? So this kid completely generalized, 100%. Um, these, this kid was at about 50%. This kid's at about 50%. This one ended close to 80 Right, and kind of climbing. So again, a really nice study showing that right, we can teach kids how to do this right, and think about what this could mean, say, in a home setting. Now, when mom does want to cook dinner or you know, wants to sit down and have coffee with dad on a Sunday morning and not be pestered right, for half an hour, that we can set up a schedule with a clock and the kid knows how to do this and off we go. Um, this was percentage of intervals scored on tasks, so not only were they right, engaged in the activity, but right, were, did they remain on task? And again, they remained on task throughout, so they're correctly doing what they're supposed to do, and they're staying where they're supposed to be, so they're not going to check on somebody or bother somebody or ask for help or any of those kinds of things. Um, Carlisle also did a whole bunch of social validity assessments. Um,
staff and same age peers, so they actually asked general ed peers um, about the procedures and outcomes, and so the peers thought this was just as cool as, as the teachers, right, the paraprofessionals, the other adults. Um, same age peers had indicated that they would be more likely to interact with or help the kids with autism if the kid with autism was using the iPod Touch, which probably makes you think, because, yeah, if the kid has the iPod Touch and the iPod Touch is the cool thing, right, there's our point of connection, right? So at least we have a point of connection. I think that's one of the reasons why people are kind of excited about this is that it is a shared point of connection that might draw in typical peers and now give us a point for moving forward socially. Um, they also went to community members, 91 community members, just kind of Joe and Sue on the street, and showed them, a, right, here's the iPod touch schedule, and here's what we've done in the past with a binder and symbols and Velcro, and which do you think is better, right, which do you think is more appropriate, um, and the community peers kind of overwhelmingly said that the iPod Touch was more acceptable, it looked more normal than the laminated Velcro kind of thing. So again, kind of this idea of community acceptance and that frankly, we're all walking around with these. So it, right, it doesn't look any different from what anybody else is doing. Um, parents of the participants all had purchased their own iPod Touches and were using schedules at home. So the parents saw how successful this was at school and kind of took the ball and ran with it. Um, and participants indicated a preference. They did some preference check with the kids. And the kids preferred the iPod Touch schedule over the old-fashioned laminate Velcro kind of schedule. So that's a really interesting look at kind of the scheduling piece. And I think, you know, really for so many of our kids, the scheduling issue is often an issue. How do we make our schedules portable? Um, how do we change things in the schedule quickly and easily? Well, and if I'm out in the community, I can snap a picture and add something to the schedule very easily. Right? So some of those kinds of things as well, scheduling can be a much less onerous task, um, putting it on a tablet and digitizing it in that way. All right, so leaving that and moving on to academic stuff, right? because now we're to the point where most schools have at least a classroom set of iPads. Um, some schools have even more than that. Um, some schools are asking all students to bring their own iPads, Right, so it's a completely digitized school. So people are starting to look at iPads and iPod Touches and other devices to support academic learning for kids with ASD and other developmental disabilities. Variety of studies, again, right, not a lot of studies. And each study has kind of addressed a different area. Once, a couple of studies have looked at time on task and reducing escape-motivated problem behavior. If we do our academic tasks on an iPad versus on paper. And surprise, surprise, um, kids are more on task and engaging in less escape-motivated problem behavior when their academic work is on a screen versus on a piece of paper. It's kind of the same for all the peers, I think, too. Um, another study looked at using the iPad to teach spell check through video modeling. So video modeling is another thing that's being done kind of across the skill set, across the board, in terms of teaching, so life skills, communication skills, academic skills, household chores, using video modeling. So I put a video model on my iPad to show you what you're supposed to do. You watch the video model, and then you do. Right? And so for this study, they looked at using a video model around how do you teach, how do you do a spell check on your computer using your word processor. Um, basic numeracy, so a couple of studies have looked at teaching counting, um, adding, writing numerals, matching numeral to the number of little pictures. So some studies have looked at that. Study has looked at solving word problems and essentially kind of having a task analysis on the iPad of here's step one, here's step two. And this study used um, video self-monitoring. So they, they wrote a script. They had the students kind of read the script and do the script while they videotaped until they got a clean piece of video. And then they would have the kids watch themselves solving a math word problem, and then solve a word problem, and then eventually faded out the video. Um, we're going to look at this study. Smith et al. looked at teaching science vocabulary, and this study is unique in that um, all of the intervention happened or primarily happened in a general education setting um, with general ed content. 
for middle school students in science. So that's kind of exciting. And, and you know, when I think about academic instruction and how we can use iPads, that's the area where I kind of get excited because how can we support kids with developmental disabilities in inclusive settings actually working on the same kind of content in a way that's relatively quick and easy um, and that teachers can adapt kind of on the fly as well. So we'll look at that study. Um, across all of these studies, the kinds of strategies that are typically used are video modeling or video self-modeling. Um, and then sometimes people are looking at either using the Keynote app and creating a slideshow or sort of a social story um, or other kinds of learning apps. There are a few studies that have looked at a specific app designed to teach counting or an app to teach how to write your numbers or how to write the ABC. So those kinds of things. The Smith et al. study looked at computer-aided instruction. So again, really not a new concept. Computer-aided instruction has been around, but they now looked at computer-aided instruction from an iPad um, and looking at teaching science terms to kids with ASD who are in a general ed setting in middle school. So these were all kids that had ASD and also had an IQ of 70 or below. Okay, so these weren't kids that you know, were on the higher functioning end of the scale academically. Um, baseline intervention generalization. So it was a, a fairly simple study. Um, what they looked at were 18 slides with terms, science terms, that were taken from the general ed curriculum content. And during baseline, each term, so they had nine terms, they were presented twice. And kids had, on a keynote, App, right, so Keynote is kind of like PowerPoint. Here's a picture with the term. It's a multiple choice question. There's voiceover that gives you directions. So essentially, what is this? Or this is a picture of? Or choose the right answer. All of the options had voiceover. So if you couldn't read, you could hear what each option was. But baseline, there was no feedback. So they first just measured, do they know the terms? Um, then they implemented the computer-aided instruction package. And during general ed, science class, at the same time that all of the other peers were doing their at-your-desk science work, these three kids had their iPad science work, which was go through your Keynote app, listen to the instructions on each slide, choose the correct answer, and now you get feedback immediately. So if you choose the incorrect answer, there's a prompt embedded in the slide that tells you which one you should choose, right? And there was randomization, so the slides were randomized, the location of the answers were randomized, right? And when they learned one set of terms to criterion, then they got a new slideshow with the next terms, and then a new slideshow, and a new slideshow, um, and carried on until the rest of the term. Um, criterion was independent and correct responding to four out of six slides within um, a probe and then they would move on to the next set of six. This is what the slides looked like. So these are actually two slides, right? So here's a picture and is it, this picture shows pizza, organ, chromosomes, or mitosis. And, right, this was, right, your, your options. Here it is again, and if you picked, say, chromosomes and that was incorrect, it would prompt the correct response, right? So you'd get a star around your correct response, or right, it would provide you that, that information. And so this is what the kids did during instruction time. They sat at their desk, the rest of the kids were doing their science work, these kids sat with their iPads. They also worked in peer prompting. Um, so as the kids were working, the researcher might be in the room, the teacher might be wandering around and, you know, speed up or take a look at this or you're doing a good job or whatever, but they also taught the peers how to do that because they're all sitting at desks next to one another. So the peers were all taught to watch and give some sort of feedback. So if they saw the kid whipping through the keynote slides too fast, the peers were taught to say, like, slow down, look at the question, what's the right answer, or to give encouragement or whatever. So, right, incorporating the peers as well. So in terms of the graph, much simpler graph to look at. Um, here's baseline, the kids didn't know the terms. Here's intervention, they learned the terms, and then they maintained afterwards. They also, for this one, looked at um, generalizing. So their generalization activity was actually a paper pencil worksheet, and they had a variety of different kinds of paper pencil worksheets. So match the term to the definition, complete a sentence using the target term, um, do a crossword puzzle with the terms. So it was all the other kinds of activities that the classroom teacher was using with students anyway. So now it's, can we use the iPad to teach these terms? And when you learn them on the iPad, can you also use that information 
for other kinds of activities and across the board, right? Again, to varying degrees, they all could. So the triangles are the generalization probes, right? And so not all of them to the same degree of accuracy, but they certainly could to some degree. Um, they also did some social validity. It's always interesting when the peers provide their social validity input. So the, the participants, the teachers, and the peers thought that this was all a good idea, but the peers also indicated a real strong desire to have iPads. That was actually their message was, I would like one for my learning content as well. Right? That was their feedback back to the peers. So if they get one, we want one too. Right? So again, and I think that this is important, right? this is something that all kids want that's a normative kind of thing. It doesn't make you look different, unusual, and in fact can make you look cool. So so now we're taking a group of kids who people have often looked at as different, unusual, uncool, and with a device, this kind of like raises them up in terms of coolness factor, right? And provides a point of social contact again. So that was a nice piece of, of academic stuff. I also believe that uh, this was a master's student as well, that this was her project. Another area that we've looked at, daily living. So teaching things like transitioning from one task to another, lots of cooking, right? Lots of can you make mac and cheese, can you cook a microwave pizza, those kinds of things. Um, household chores, right? Can you vacuum? Can you dust? Can you do those kinds of things? And again, video modeling, video prompting, and some studies have also used apps where we can embed self-monitoring within as well. So there's essentially a task analysis list with boxes, and on your iPad you can make the check mark to show that you've done each step. So there are a number of studies that have looked at all of these. We're not going to have time to talk about all of them, um, but I did want to show you a bit of a screenshot. This was a study that looked at video prompting um, and used the app called Picture Scheduler. So this is an app that you can buy, and the way Picture Scheduler works is that you can make little video clips and sequence them, and then the individual can watch the sequenced set of videos and they can also swipe and delete steps as they're done and it doesn't delete it permanently it just deletes it from their list right now and then right we store everything in the cloud or on our computer and we can bring that back up again and then as you click on a specific step then you get the video that shows you how to measure the milk or how to stir the pot or how to program the microwave so um, those kinds of things so those have been really quite effective um, health and safety, another area. There are three studies that are kind of interesting um, and two that have been done outside of kind of the special ed area. Um, a study that just came out is in the Pediatric Journal of Nursing and has looked at uh, using the iPad to deliver social scripts, social story type interventions to support kids with autism at imaging appointments at the hospital, so CT and x-ray and those kinds of things. And they actually did a randomized study with 16 kids in a control group and 16 kids in the intervention group and looked at measuring stress response. Um, they looked at measuring time from when the procedure starts to when the procedure ends and um, problem behavior during procedures and for the kids that got this little iPad delivered script and they went around the hospital and you know took pictures of all the equipment um, and had a little voiceover story that for those kids, they were way less stressed, there was way less problem behavior, they were way more cooperative, and the procedure was done faster. Right? So I think seeing those kinds of things in, say, medical settings is a really interesting direction. Another group looked at using iPads with adults with intellectual disabilities who were needing to record their food and drink intake for health reasons and couldn't remember their food and health intake, taking pictures. And they'd given them a piece of paper that was one inch or whatever, and they were instructed to put the piece of paper on their plate next to their food. That helped the researchers know portion size because they could compare what was in the picture to the one inch strip. And they taught the individuals to just snap a picture every time before you have your meal. Um, and then you go to your medical appointment with your pictures, and now the, the medical personnel can go through and get a sense of what you're eating, how much you're eating. So that was kind of cool. Um, and I also found one just the other day that uh, was kind of off in another land, but teaching individuals who are in a college program, dorm college program for adults with intellectual disability, how to use um, an iPod to navigate through the college campus. And they essentially had like a video slideshow of 
navigational points throughout the campus and so they taught individuals how to use this to make it from this class to that class, the dorm to the student union building. So some kind of health and safety things that people are starting to do that are also kind of exciting. Um, and then we've got employment. So again, a fair bit of employment based stuff focusing a lot on video modeling and video prompting to teach how to do your job and how to do your job correctly. Um, how to transition between tasks, how to remember what your tasks are and how to do your tasks with fewer and fewer errors. Really with the focus on not requiring job coaches. Okay, so using video modeling and video prompting have really helped in that area. There are also some studies that have looked at some of the basic apps like your, your calendar app, your timer app to remember to stop and take your break, to remember that now it's time to transition, to remember the list of activities that you're supposed to do. So some of the really basic things that, frankly, most of us already use our devices for. Um, a really interesting study that was done recently um, looked at video modeling, video prompting, feedback around job training and job performance for a very, very complex job, a shipping warehouse task that had on average 73 steps, but the number of steps ranged from 64 to 104. And so they surveyed the people who held the job and sort of made a task analysis. Um, the participants were four young men who were not employed. Um, varying IQ, so up to a 121 IQ, so not individuals all who had cognitive challenges, but did have challenges securing and holding a job. Um, one participant had a bunch of other diagnoses, OCD, ADHD, Tourette's, and, and one participant had a visual impairment but could still see the iPad. They created an app that they delivered on a Samsung Galaxy tab. This app is now available for iOS, so iPhone, but through the US store only. So if you want it, you need to have your US account. Um, but they made video models. For the employer, he required 100% accuracy. If you were going to work for him, you had to pretty much be perfect because um, you're shipping out product and fairly complicated product. But the way that this app works, and I want to get my hands on this app now, um, all of the videos can get categorized into chapters. And they worked with OTs and did a whole research review when they designed this app. Um, and then once you select a chapter and then you select a video to watch, you can decide how you're gonna watch the video. You can watch with no stops and it shows the task all the way through. Or you can choose to watch with stops and it breaks at each spot of the task, right? And anytime you're watching, regardless of which option you chose, touch the screen to pause, Touch the screen to start. Touch anywhere so you don't need to have great motor skills. You just need to be able to lay your hand on the screen. Um, so for this study, they had the participants multiple probe across participants. They started with the regular 45-minute um, orientation instruction session that happens for all employees, and that was their baseline condition. Um, and then they did the study, right, with the intervention where they gave them the tablet and sent them home for a week and just said, watch as much as you can. And then when they came back to work, they said, watch this, use this while you're doing your job. And here's the data. So remember, it has to be 100% for them to remain employed here. And these are all unemployed men. So during baseline, this is after the 45 minutes I'm going to tell you how to do your job. Couldn't do it. Could almost do it, but then dropped off. The large dots mean 100%. So his first time he got 100%, but then you can see he's forgetting. Um, and this one, he kind of climbed a little bit, but never reached 100%. And here you see he's still having some issues, but he hit 100% once. This guy, three out of four times, 100%, 100% across the board. And last two data points, 100%. So a really nice, um, very well-programmed video modeling app to teach a really complex skill. So I think a lot of the research so far has looked at fairly simple employment skills. This is the only one that's looked at something that's this complex um, and getting individuals working um, in really challenging jobs. So in terms of general summary for, for employment, the research so far is showing that people need to rely on job coaches less and they become more independent, primarily with video modeling and video prompting. 
Basic apps are also good. There was a study that looked at kind of case report study. One woman had anxiety at work and they put a mindfulness-based app and used the clock timer to prompt her once an hour to stop and do some deep breathing and her productivity went way up um, because she was remembering to stop and kind of regulate around her anxiety. And then tablets are generally viewed as really acceptable in an employment environment. So it's fairly accepted by the other people in, in work environments. Right? So that's the general overview in terms of employment. So in terms of what we know today, right, remembering that tablets have only been around for less than 10 years, um, we have emerging support. Right? So in no way at this point are we looking at evidence-based. We haven't had that many studies and these haven't been around a whole lot, although it's really building a lot on evidence of other kinds of technology, so we can kind of borrow from the evidence base that we do have. I mean, there's evidence based for video modeling. This is just a different way of delivering the video model. So I think that's important to remember. But at this point, we've got research that looks at the use across ages and also across ability levels. So with quote unquote more challenged individuals to individuals who are more cognitively typical in a variety of environments and also being implemented by parents as well as professionals. We're starting to see a little bit of research where it's not just the researcher doing the implementation but other people um, doing implementation. We know that assessment is critical. Right? So it's not just, well, the kid next door uses this so you'll use this too because you both have autism. So. Right? So it, it's important to pay attention to the needs of individuals and to really make some decisions um, regarding the type of device or app based on our understanding of the person, needs, strengths, the app, what the app provides. So it really means you need to know not only the individual, but you need to know the tools. Ongoing evaluation is important like it is with everything else that we do in this field. It's not just evaluate at the beginning and we go. We need to continue to evaluate whether or not things are working. And if they're not, we need to change. We also know that individual preference matters. Right? So what a person likes is important to know. Right? And individuals who don't like tablets are probably not going to do real well with tablets. Right? And individuals who really, really like tablets probably more likely to do better. So it is important to pay attention to the preferences of the individuals we're supporting. The other thing that we know is that good behavior analytic instruction is crucial. Right? It is not just give the device and good luck with that, off you go. We need to teach prerequisite skills like attending to the screen. Right? If we're teaching imitation off of video modeling, we need to teach those skills. We have to teach device operation. It does no good for a person to have their communication system on an iPad if they don't know how to open it and unlock it and get to what they need, right? So they need to know how to operate it if they're truly going to be independent in using this tool. They need to, you know, we need to be teaching within meaningful contexts, and that's really important. And we also need to pay attention to teaching device maintenance to the individual. So plug it in, back it up, right? Those kinds of things, again, so that people can be as maximally independent as possible, right? As opposed to us having to do all the legwork. The other things that we really need to consider, and this comes up a lot, time. Particularly when we're talking about video models, video prompting, picture schedules, right? It takes time to create these things, and it, creates, it, it requires some degree of know-how. Right? Again, this is where I think if we use siblings and school peers, there's our know-how, right? Where we can kind of say, I want a video, and I want it to look like this. The 14-year-old in the classroom next door can probably make it for me better and faster than I could right, because they know how. So I think really paying attention to the resources that we have around us is important, but knowing that this does take time. All of the studies so far, it's been the researcher putting all of the supports together. That's great, the researcher has time to do so. But mom, dad, and classroom teacher and SEA likely don't have the hours of video editing time. So we need to be thinking about those things. Um, we need to train our implementers. So again, a lot of the research has predominantly been researcher implemented, a little bit of parent implemented, and we know that if we train parents well, they can implement. 
but we need to provide good implementer training. And not just around the intervention, but also around how to use the device, how to maintain the device, how to use the device in natural settings, right? And the instructional strategies. How do you prompt? How do you fade? How do you reinforce? How do you do all of that stuff so that we're delivering good instruction? Because right? I think for a lot of parents, what's frustrating is that they'll get an app that they think is going to work for whatever skill they want to teach, but they don't know how to teach it. They put the app in front of the kid, it doesn't work, and what do they, oh, well, this app doesn't work. Well, it's about instructional strategy, right? So we need to be teaching our implementers how to implement. We also need to be thinking about what apps we load. And this is a real issue when we talk about tablets for AAC. If the tablet has your AAC app on it, but it also has YouTube and Angry Birds and Dora the Explorer and whatever else that the kid really likes, guess where they're going to spend all of their time? Right? And this is a, a difficult thing because there's lots of really good learning apps too. But if there's a fun learning app that's more fun than navigating my way through my AAC app, guess where I'm going to spend my time, right? So really thinking about not overloading kids' iPads with a whole bunch of stuff. If we're teaching and really focusing on AAC, perhaps this is a dedicated device and it's just AAC. There are more and more families starting to have two devices. One is our AAC device and the other is our learning device. And, and keep you quiet when I'm driving the car device, right? That you can watch YouTube on when I need to cook dinner. But the AAC device is the AAC device. The other thing that you can do alternatively is use the guided access option to lock kids out of, right? So you open up your AAC app and they can't get into other apps without the special triple tap that we never let them see us do when we switch things. Because if they see us do that, they'll know how and then we have a problem. So we really need to be thinking about some of these things. And these, these issues haven't been talked a lot about in the literature. The issue of kids getting out of the Target app and into other stuff came up in one article that I read where they had behavior issues where the kid didn't want to stay in the app they were working in and wanted, kept exiting. But that's only one article where people have really talked about that issue. But I know, and I'm sure you know, that with lots of kids, that's an issue. Um, the other thing that I read that was kind of interesting, and I, I spent a little time looking around, Laura in 2014 sort of summarized her study and talked about um, an article by Ogden Lindsay, Lindsay in 1964, where he, ta he talked about, you know, the, the challenges individuals have in learning isn't so much their challenge alone, it's really about an interaction between the individual and the environment, and he talked about environmental prostheses and prostheses in general and how if we provide prostheses we can really help individuals learn stuff and kind of narrow the gap between an individual's limitations and the requirements of the broader environment um, and Laura kind of talked a bit about this in, in her paper and I went and looked at the Lindsley article and he talked about three strategies the construction of prosthetic devices prosthetic training and construction of prosthetic environments. And so, as I thought about this, um, presumably he wasn't thinking about tablet devices in 1964, right? or maybe he was, um, but presumably not. However, if we kind of think about this, it's really applicable when we think about what's happening with today and current technology. So here are our prosthetic devices. right? And we've had other prosthetic devices. We've had the binders with the laminated symbols, but right, I would suggest that this is probably a far more um, portable and certainly cooler prosthetic device using tablets, right, to do all of the kinds of things that we've done. We look at prosthetic training. And prosthetic training is really our application of individualized, good applied behavior analytic instruction to teach individuals to use whatever apps we're using to address whatever target skills we're trying to teach, right? And so I've talked about all of these this afternoon in terms of the kinds of um, instructional strategies. And then he talked about prosthetic environments. And this is starting to happen. If you go out into the community, you're starting to see things like iPads at restaurants being put on tables and you make, place your order on your iPad and it gets zipped to the kitchen. Um, this is from a drugstore where you can look up information on products on the iPad. Um, this is from a doctor's office where you now check in via the tablet at the desk. So these kinds of things are starting to happen out in the broader community, essentially meeting individuals with disabilities halfway. 
right? It's that universal design issue again, right? The ramp is good for the person in the wheelchair, but it's also good for me with my wheelie case and the mom with the stroller and so on and so forth. So I think what Lindsley talked about in 1964, though he likely wasn't talking about tablets, I think is very applicable when we think about that today and that iPads are another behavior prosthetic, right? It's a prosthetic device that we can use to support individuals to function more independently in the broader community, more successfully in the broader community. So where do we need to go from here? Obviously, we need a lot more research. We've had a lot of research, um, but we need a lot more. We need to know about good assessment. What does good, effective, individualized assessment look like to help us make good app decisions so that we're not just choosing an app because the kid with autism in the next door uses it? Right? Um, how do we progress monitor? How do we know that what we're doing in terms of our intervention with this specific app is working or not? And then what do we do if it's not? So that research needs to happen. We need more research in terms of application of instructional strategies to teach target behaviors using tablets. So how do we make our tablet usage more effective um, for individuals? How do we do a better job at teaching? How do we train implementers in a way so that Parents know how, peers know how, employers know how, and so on and so forth. And then finally, we need a lot more uh, research in terms of effectiveness. So people are really targeting a whole bunch of areas, and we've talked about those areas today, daily living, employment, and academics, and so on. We really need more research to look at how effective is this for, for supporting people, right? Is it more effective than some of the other things? When is it more effective? When is it not more effective? So there are still lots and lots of questions out there, um, but I think people are getting more and more excited about it, and hopefully right, that graph that I showed at the beginning in terms of numbers continues to climb.